now and I'll share my screen. Okay, so uh, today's just some more details on Unix shells. So the practical exercise for you are supposed to write a simple yet functional Unix shell. So, well, um, some of you, uh, well, or of the students taking the course, not of you specifically, might have struggled because they actually have never used the Unix shell before, which, uh, yeah, uh, of course, is problematic when you have to implement one. That's uh, understandable. So, in, in general, just an overview again. So, we, we had these questions of building a shell in, in certain parts. So, the first part was just reading something from the uh, terminal from, from your keyboard and then just splitting it up into tokens. So, and that's exactly what a standard Unix shell does. So it reads commands from what is called its standard input or file descriptor zero. So when you do a read or a get s or a read line or a scan f, uh, all these just read from the standard input. And as you've seen, uh, well, you can redirect this if you want. We'll uh, come to redirection later. And the shell can write outputs. So regular output like your shell prompt is printed to file descriptor one, which is the standard out channel. And on Unix, there's a separate output channel again for error messages, standard error. You don't have to use it, you can use it. Uh, so, but it would be perfectly fine for your shell implementation to just write the error messages also on, on your regular output. A real shell keeps them separate, so it's easier to manage. So. What should you do when you try to read commands from the keyboard or from standard in? Well, for many, many years, Unix has proposed just using the get s function. Now get s is a function that takes a string, so a character pointer parameter. And this character pointer parameter has to be a pointer to an allocated buffer. So either something, well, allocated as a uh, global or local variable here as an array of characters and you pass a pointer to it or something uh, that would be the return value from a heap allocation, so from malloc. Now the problem with get as is that get as reads until you hit return. So if you enter more characters than uh, you have space for in your buffer, then you tend to overwrite beyond the end of the buffer. And this is a classical security problem, the buffer overflow. This is why most modern C compilers, when you try to use get s, output a warning that you definitely please don't try to use get s, use something different. And that's a really good advice because using get s has been the source of many, many serious security problems. Why is it still in Unix when it's so dangerous? Well, because there is old software that relies on using get s. So it's not that easy to get rid of it. So Unix is like uh, more than 50 years old now. So essentially we have to provide it for some sort of compatibility, but nevertheless, for new software you develop, please don't use it. Some of you uh, I heard as feedback from the TAs have used scanf. Scanf might be difficult in some cases because scanning stops when an input character does not match a format character. That's from the man page. So for scanf, you have to specify a format where, uh, to which your input needs to conform. Uh, an alternative uh, would be getline. Getline is a relatively new function and getline is very convenient because if you pass the right set of parameters, as mentioned at the man page, it even allocates the memory buffer for you so uh, it can also extend your given memory buffer. So it's sa a safe alternative to get S and that's what I would recommend. But of course it's Unix, so you're free to choose any working solution, but uh, I would really, really want to discourage you from using get S. All right. So this is one of the slides I already showed last week. As I said, we, uh, I'll repeat just some of that stuff here. So, uh, what uh, does parsing a Unix command line look like? So usually a Unix shell first prints a prompt. So this is what's shown here in blue. And this prompt just gives some information. The, the most important information it gives is that the shell is ready for entering commands. And then you can print some additional information. For example, your current directory, uh, which makes it easier to navigate your directory tree. 
And then you can enter a command. And the first thing on the command line is always the name of the command. Then you have, uh, so in green here, then you have a number of parameters. There may be also commands without parameters. So these are optional, these are in purple here. And then you might have input redirections here in orange. So a less than sign, and then the name of an input file. And you can have output redirections. So a greater than sign and the name of an result or output file. So input and output redirections are also optional and input and output redirections can come in any order. So you can redirect input first or output first. You can redirect only one of them. You can redirect both. Or if you redirect none, then your standard assignments for the input and output channels remain the same. So output is to your screen, input is from your keyboard. And if you do redirect, you just replace keyboard and screen channels by the files given. So today this is called while a REPL a read evaluate print loop. So it reads commands, it evaluates them by executing them, and then you get some results. And well, that's simply enough. But of course, if you never used a command line before, that maybe takes some time getting used to. Now, what's important is these parameters are always separated by usually white space. So this is usually one or more space characters or a tab character, for example. And this is what you can use in parsing to separate your input line into these separate tokens. Now, one question that came up on Piazza is what about the order on the command line? So uh, take a look at these three examples here. So first we do a bin ls dash l slash bin slash user bin. So we want a long listing of the files in the bin directory and in the user bin directory. And we want the output of this ls command to be redirected to a file temp listing. So that's what the first command does. Now the question was, can these redirections come in any order? So can I do uh, first a redirection to temp listing and then enter parameters? Or can I do it somewhere in the middle even? Turns out after 30 years of using Unix, yes, you can. <laughs> I haven't known that before. Uh, it's obvious that it makes parsing easier for a real shell. Most people don't expect it. You can actually do it, but you don't have to. So. Uh, it would make parsing the command line maybe more difficult depending on how you actually structure this. So your shell does not have to support this. So for your shell, it's sufficient if just IO redirection for input and output comes at the end and you don't accept any parameters after your first IO redirection. But however, uh, what I wanted and what was stated in the exercise was that redirections can come in any order. So you can do an input redirection first and then an output redirection, or you can do it the other way around. So first do an output redirection and then an input redirection. So that's just to make life easier for you. Uh, well, uh, but in a real Unix shell, actually stuff like that works, but it can get very confusing. So this is also a slide from uh, last week. So how do you do this parsing? You can do it by hand. I did it by hand. You can make a lot of errors because as you know, C is not really ideal for string processing. Uh, you could do it using the Lex scanner generator if you especially are also uh, participating in the compilers course, or you can use one of the uh, libc functions for string tokenization, str talk. And we, I already showed some examples here. So these are very convenient. And we've seen some questions from students using STR talk. There's also a more modern alternative called STR sep, uh, string separation, uh, which might be more convenient for you. It doesn't matter which one we use. A manual implementation is fine. STR talk is fine. STR sep is fine. Using Lex as a scanner generator is fine. Whatever suits you best. And if you manage to find a completely different solution, we would like to hear about this. So as always in Unix, there's different options to get things right, especially since some of these options developed over time to replace older versions like STR sep replaced STR talk and get line replaced get s. And these are more convenient, easier to use, but the old versions are kept around for compatibility's sake. <clears throat> now, uh, another question was about which of these many exec calls should we use? 
Now, obviously, this depends on how you set up arguments. So for some of the exec calls like exec L, you state all, each of the arguments separately here on the command line. Now, if you actually want to pass a, a parameter array that you scanned and you have an array of like strings, uh, then uh, exec L is really inconvenient to use. So what you could do then is use one of the exec V functions here, where you actually pass a pointer to an array of strings. That might work better for you. Um, read the man page for this. There's a lot of options. Since it depends on how you structure your uh, input parsing, I cannot give a general rec uh, recommendation, but it seems that many of you have used exec V successfully. So maybe that's worth taking a look at. So the next part was IO redirection. So since there was also some confusion on this, I thought I'd give some more general information. So you should know that a Unix program that you create using the fork system call inherits all file descriptors of its parent. There's an S too many. Of course, it only has one parent process and especially the standard in, standard out and standard error channels, which usually point to your keyboard input and to your screen output. So what's the general way to do input output redirection? Now, in, when you do input output redirection, you, the idea is that your child process doesn't have to know about this. So when you exec another program, this program already has IO redirected. So what you do is when you write your shell, you create a child process using fork. And then in your parent process, so if the returned PIT is the PIT of the child, so not equal to zero, you just wait for termination of the child process. And uh, well, you already had an exercise on this. You should know how to do this. And in your child process, so if your return process ID is zero, then you need to check if input redirection was indicated on the command line, you want to redirect input from a file to your standard input. So you have to open the file for read. If this doesn't work, it's an error. So then you can just print an error message and, and terminate the fork process. If it works, then you redirect the input file descriptor standard in to that file. And we'll show on the next slide how that works. Additionally, if output redirection is indicated, you output you open the output file for writing. If it's not existing, you need to create it. So check the man page for write. There's an option to create a file if it doesn't exist. And then you redirect the, sorry, the output file descriptor. Obviously, that's a typo standard out. So these are optional. So if there's an input redirection, redirect the input. Obviously, if there's an output redirection, redirect the output. If there is no input output redirection, you don't need to redirect anything. So standard in, standard out are the same as the standard in and out the shell is using. So usually your screen and keyboard. And after that, use one of the exec functions we've just seen to call the program that was indicated as the first parameter, as the first uh, string on the command line. And this Unix shell IO redirection uh, works using one of these system calls or libc calls. That's a system call in this case. So either dub, so dub duplicates the given file descriptor. So the file descriptor that was returned by opening the file for redirecting input or output. And it duplicates it to the first free file descriptor. So for dub, if you want to redirect a file to standard input, a standard input to a file, then you have to close standard input first. This is file descriptor zero. So it's the lowest closed file descriptor and dub would then duplicate the file descriptor of the file that was passed on the command line to standard in. So standard in is redirected to that file. Same for standard out, you just close standard out and you call dub or there's a more convenient call, which is also more recent. So this was also superseded in Unix because that's more convenient, which just duplicates one file descriptor into another. Both work. It's a matter of taste which one you actually want to use. So as always, for details, there's man pages. 
The next partial question was about implementing internal shell commands. And the question was, why are CD and exit implemented as internal commands? And again, if you're not used to Unix shells, that might be a bit of a strange concept. So I thought I'd explain a bit more. So every Unix process has the concept of a current directory. And that means whenever this Unix process accesses a file or a path name that doesn't start with a slash, which is called a relative path name, then it's always a relative indication and it's relative to that current directory. So if I enter a file name, foo.c, this foo.c is assumed to be in the current directory. If I enter a partial pass, so without a slash at the beginning, so just sub der file.c, and my current directory is home me, then it would refer to, well, we have a line break here, the absolute pass slash home slash me, and then we add this partial part behind it. So sub der file.c. Now there's an exception to this. If you look up commands, so if you want to start a command like ls, this is not generally true. Instead, a, a normal Unix shell searches executable files in a set of directory, which is specified in a so-called environment variable. So that's a variable you can set in a normal Unix shell. And this is called dollar path. So this path has just a list of directory names and this list of directory names separated by colons just uh, is the list that the shell goes through one after the other to find an executable like ls. So uh, there's one problem with this. Now, if it would automatically search in the current directory, which is usually indicated as dot in Unix, uh, or if this is in pass, we have a possible security problem. And that's just not really related to the exercise, but something worth mentioning, I think, if you want to continue using Unix after this. So what is this security problem and why is this a problem? Now imagine you had a shell pass such as dot, so you first search in your current directory, then colon is a separator, then you search in slash bin, and then you search in slash user bin. So the shell always starts looking for a command in the current directory, whatever that is, then in bin and then in user bin. What happens if you type ls? Well, ls is first searched for in the current directory. If it's not found there, it's searched for in bin. And if it's not found there, it's searched for in user bin. And if it's also not found there, the shell complains that it can't find it. So what if you type cd slash temp? So your current directory is now the temporary directory slash temp and then typed ls you would expect your standard Unix LS command to run. And what happened if some other user left an executable program in temp that is called LS and that would not list the directory but delete your home directory? Ouch. That can happen. And especially on early systems where like 500 students had to share one Unix machine instead of each one having his or her own laptop. Uh, very many students like to do pranks like these. Uh, this was fun to a certain extent, probably not uh, for uh, those students who were affected by this. So uh, just be careful with this. Now, just to make it clear, your shell doesn't have to implement this path handling. You can actually do it automatically by using exec.vp, but since we don't have any mechanisms implemented for setting or reading environment here, because we wanted to keep it relatively simple, uh, you don't need to do it. The consequence is, if you don't implement this path handling, you always have to enter the complete path name for commands. So slash bin slash ls, instead of just typing ls. Uh, so the next question was, of course, why is exit not implemented as an internal command? So for CD, it's clear because CD is always changing the directory of the current process. And if we forked a process for this, this would be a different process that changed the directory, but the parent process doesn't know about this. Now exit, I think it's relatively clear. So if you try to implement exit as an external command, it might look like this. So you just call exit in main, well, and that exits the program, which is your child process, but not your shell. And of course, exit should exit your current shell. So yes. So in implementing internal commands means 
whenever you uh, parse a command line, you need to first check if it's an internal command like CD or exit. And if not, then you can fork and exec. So the final task was to implement simple shell scripting. And I'm afraid that some of you actually thought it would be really complicated. And there has been quite a bit of confusion about shell scripts. A shell script on Unix is just a simple text file with shell commands, usually one command per line. So if you want to do ls uh, and then another ls, you just typed two lines containing one line ls each and then saved it as a file. Now a real Unix shell also can implement control structures like loops or if conditions. You don't have to do it obviously. So your shell only has to implement simple sequences of commands, just as if you type them one after the other on the command line by hand. And you would call it like this. So if your shell would be called wish and your executable for your wish shell would be in the current directory, you would call dot slash wish. Now you know why we type dot slash because we don't want dot in our current directory. So we have to tell our shell either to include it in its past. So if it's a, a complete Unix shell and not your own implementation, or you just tell your shell that wish is in the current directory dot so dot slash means look in the current directory for an executable called wish. And then as the only parameter, you pass a name of the shell script, which might be called shell script.sh. And this is absolutely simple. And I was hoping, but I don't think it has worked out that well, that when you implemented IO redirection, you got the idea that since a shell script is just working like reading commands from the command line, you could well, do it in a similar way. So I don't want to give you the solution here, obviously, but think about what happens if you call your shell like this or just experiment with this. Write a shell script containing like two or three shell commands for your wish shell, and then do an input redirection when you call your wish shell. And then you might find a very easy way to figure out how to implement it. It's like two lines of code. And finding that out maybe gives a good idea why, why it's a great idea that in Unix, everything is treated as a file or, and the file is just a character stream. But yeah, I'm not giving too many hints because you still have a couple of days to submit your solutions. And, oh, I just seen it. I didn't change the uh, text down here. So it's of course not a compiler's q and It's OS q and but that was probably obvious. So uh, summarizing it, Again, that's what I already showed last week. So if you want to do a diagram of how a shell works, of course, you start by initializing a shell, printing a prompt. Then you read your command line, you scan and parse it. And so the result of this is giving you a command line, a, a list of arguments, so your par parameters optionally for your command, an optional input redirection with a file name, an optional output redirection with a file name, and then you need to check first for internal commands. So was it CD? Then you can change your directory. Was it exit? Then you can just exit. Or was it none of those? Then it must be an external command. And you don't need to check for the existence of the external command. You can just try to execute it. If it doesn't exist, exit, com exit complaints. So you don't have to invest work here. So what you do is you fork. So you get a parent process, which just does a wait pit, for example for the termination of the child and as a child process, you check if you need to redirect the input and do the opening of the redirect file and then do a dub, for example, or you do it with dub2. Uh, you do the optional output redirect and then you can call one of the exec calls and then you can check for the result of exec. So if exec actually returns, something went wrong. So for example, you try to execute a file that didn't exist you try to execute a file for which you didn't have execute permission, or you tried, for example, to execute your C source code, which is not, uh, uh, even if it was executable, which the operating system wouldn't know how to execute. So it would complain about. So this is in general how a shell works. In this implementation here, it's a rather simple program. So of course, if you look at old Unix source code for like sixth or seventh edition from the like late, mid and late 1970s, 
a shell is not much more complicated. It has control structures and stuff like this, but a shell is generally like this. If you look at a modern shell like GNU Bash or ZSH or whatever, or there's also a nice shell called FISH, F-I-S-H. So all shells end with SH for shell. So as, as, you, as always, there's always some nice names you can find, like WISH, obviously. And uh, of course, these are hundreds of thousands lines of code. They have so many additional features. That's horrible. But the basic concept behind this is actually very simple. And so I thought this exercise would be nice, a nice exercise to show you. This is not magic that's happening here. You could actually implement an important part of the operating system on your own. And you could actually use it as your own command shell if you wanted. I would recommend it in that state, but you could. And that's nice because Unix is one of the few systems allowing to replace such an important system, uh, part of an operating system, like just uh, yeah, the command interpreter for command lines. And that's a nice thing because it shows Unix is approachable. And is, if you don't like the way the shell is working, you can do a completely different structure of command inputs. You can write a graphical shell. Uh, you can have uh, whatever voice recognition or something like that. And you can use it as your Unix shell. And I think that's that's a great idea. And it shows you it's possible with, like my shell implementation was about 100 lines of code, including comments and stuff like that. And uh, maybe it's, uh, it's possible to go even lower with the amount of code required. So I th think that might have possibly cleared up some confusions about uh, what I actually wanted you to uh, achieve. Uh, so I, I had the impression some of you are thinking too complicated sometimes, like, uh, what else does he want? Well, think simple. Unix is simple. Unix is trying to be simple, even, even if it doesn't show in the current, yeah, like Linux environment or something like that. But the basic principles are simple. And I don't want you to implement a complete bash shell, obviously. So uh, keep it simple. And if you really think it's too simple, of course, it's perfectly fine to ask. Uh, and we're happy to answer your questions. So that's all from my side for today. And I'll stop the screen sharing. And I want to register. Yes, now.